everybody. Hi, Robson. Welcome to Forum, Occupy Forum. So we have with us tonight Ahmed Salah, and um, we are so lucky. He is going to talk to us about Tahrir Square and what happened in Egypt and what's happening today and how it relates to our movement, Occupy. Um, we will recognize a lot of the tactics that they use, that we use. So we'll see our roots talked about tonight, and he'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. So here he is, Ahmed. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you all for coming here tonight. I have to apologize for my cough. Uh, it is not a cough because I have cold or any infection. It's because my lungs are a bit damaged from gases and torture. So I'm sorry, it's very chronic and it's always there. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Uh, we've got uh, a few things to talk about. Uh, I've already spoke about very like off-track issues a while ago with different questions. But uh, now we are going to start to talk about uh, what everybody's here for. Uh, so thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, let's talk about what happened in Egypt. Uh, what happened in Egypt did not happen in January 2011. Uh, it happened so long before. We have been fighting for change for a long time. We've been trying and failing. Trying and failing. We thought we came close and we had to face the brutal reality of having our aspirations and dreams shattered. We came quite close in 2005 and we thought we are getting there. We are going to overthrow the dictator. And uh, unfortunately we ended up in jail. I was almost killed in 2006 in jail. I was tortured. <laughs> I had my fair share of uh, Let's say that stuff like knowing I can, I will never see the, the light of day again and I'm out for my grave. Uh, but I survived, others survived, and we continued the fight. And uh, the most important thing that I would like to say about this is never give up. Never give up. We were always very few. We were always very few. We, it came down to be just a handful of people still thinking about change and trying to change several times. Because everybody else is too defeated and they give up. And you have to start from scratch. We start again <coughs> from scratch and we go through it again. Okay. So. I, I was leading a youth movement, uh, the first youth movement in the country in 2005, uh, which was called Youth for Change. And that was infiltrated and sabotaged and destroyed by the end of 2006. So we had no youth movement. We were unable to go back to the street <coughs> because of the oppression and how the regime had been dealing with us. <coughs> and especially with all the terrors that we have seen <coughs> sorry <coughs> before <coughs> so uh, yeah th these things had always been uh, you know how things would be uh, but afterwards there was this idea that started to come like how about trying to work in a very different uh, method building a new youth movement that will not be totally public. It will be public, but with a structure that is secret. It should have a group leadership. <coughs> it should have, oh, I have water, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and three levels of leadership and semi-independent cells or secret groups that are built uh, geographically with no more than 20 persons in each cell. 
The number is important. The idea was to have between 6 and 20 in every one of these cells, because 6 is the minimum number you need for a street action. And you don't need more than 20 for a cell to do this, or things will go out of hand. And we started building something that we called April 6. To do this, uh, a public face had to be chosen and try to strategize and to build these different you know, cells and everything. But that all went out of hand. The person that was supposed to be just a camera person uh, became uh, the built a hierarchy, wanting to be the top person, hijacking the whole idea and trying to deal with the situation didn't really uh, result any good results. I've been trying to change this and to work from inside and that failed. But anyway, there was a plan for a revolution in 2011 that I had back in 2008. And this may sound like a very wild, uh, you know, like, something that I'm pretending, but it's actually uh, proven in the WikiLeaks cables. There is a cable that goes back to 2008, and I was talking to the American ambassador in Cairo about my plans for the revolution in 2011, because I wanted that the United States would not take a hostile stand, as usual, in support of the dictatorship. And I was trying to make it clear for the American government that what we are trying to do is not against anybody and we just want our freedom. So th this can be verified. But that plan was not the plan that we used in 2011. <laughs> there were modifications, of course, as things had uh, evolved and changed. The idea was to have by the end of 2010, particularly by the November parliamentarian elections in 2010, at least 50 of those semi-independent small cells in Greater Cairo and 15 in every government, that they would start agitate, agitating the population in these areas, in the different neighborhoods, building up for a revolution in April or July 2011. That was the original plan, old plan, which I didn't follow because that was not possible. There was no movement. Uh, the movement that uh, I was hoping would be the tool and uh, the catalyst for that thing to happen didn't exist. Uh, the April 6th movement was about two and a half dozen members. Two thirds of them are trying to overthrow the dictator in the movement and one third supportive to the dictator. That was it. That was the situation by the end of 2010. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm saying that uh, there was only a very small number, maybe two and a half dozen members, and they were divided uh, about maybe uh, 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 two-thirds of them, they were trying to overthrow the, the person that was leading, and one-third was supportive to him. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, uh, that, that was the situation at that time. Um, so it, it seemed very frustrating, it seemed like a big failure. There was under my point of view at that time, we had absolutely no chance for change in 2011. It seemed very dark. But still, uh, I have always believed that no matter how much I think it's an impossible situation, you'll have to keep on trying. Yeah, that's what we've been doing for years, so like nothing was new. Things started to happen. And Early December 2010, there was this officer in the intelligence who put his name uh, picture on the internet with some very seriously disturbing information. He was talking about the conspiracy of the regime for the succession scenario in 2011 as in starting terrorist attacks on different targets, putting the country on the verge of civil war, in order to have a huge crackdown and make everything fall in the hand of the, the son of the dictator. This guy, he disappeared, of course. He was real. I had doubts at the time that, is he really real? Like, 
His name was Ayman Salim, he was Major Ayman Salim, and he disappeared. Um, then things started to happen as he said. New Year's Eve 2011, uh, there was this terrorist attack on a church in Alexandria killing four dozen people, injuring others, and it was devastating, it was incredible. So, uh, shocked with this, we realized that the authorities are cleaning the scene without forensics examining it. What's going on? They want to wipe out evidence? They must be responsible, as this former Major Ayman Salim had said. We started protests a few days after. January 3rd, in my neighborhood of Shobra, which is in, in, in Cairo, close to downtown. This neighborhood is very special because it's a neighborhood that is huge, actually. <laughs> it has about seven million people, and about one third of them are Coptic Christians, which makes it the place with the highest Christian population in the whole of the Middle East, uh, even more than countries. Uh, so we decided to uh, start protests there, hoping that this would be a tool of pressure against the regime. We started a protest in the central part of Shubra, near my house, it's called Shubra Circus, and uh, uh, we uh, started as only protesters, like politically involved people and all that. By the end, we started getting some Coptic youth joining, but they were kind of very hostile. They seemed very fanatic. Uh, like drawing the cross on their forehead or their chest and being very fiery and saying bad slogans against Muslims. We started talking with them. At the beginning there they showed distrust but then they started understanding that we are all fighting the same enemy. And that was a remarkable change in the course of actions. From that night and for four days, large protests that would have thousands and thousands of protesters were emerging in Shobra, rallying in the area and even beyond. And those protests were made by Muslims and Christians together against what happened and against the involvement of the government in the terrorist attack. The security had tried to break this, of course, they did all sorts of things to initiate violence. I myself, I was an eyewitness of this when I was trying to escape rocks that were being thrown and just getting into a narrow alley where there were these guys in civilian clothes throwing stones at the, protest, at, at the, the security ranks and I was trying to stop them and they wouldn't listen to me and then I, I, I hit in a building to realize that everybody around me in that building, in that entrance of the building, are security, police, covering themselves with civilian clothes over their uniform. And I tried to speak to them that thinking still innocently or stupidly, naively, that these guys throwing stones are protesters. Like, we are so sorry, this is not about violence. We don't yeah. accept any violence and we don't want this. I would go out again and talk to them. They would look at me. <laughs> I'm stupid. But I didn't figure out until later because then I won't, like, they would never listen to me and they keep throwing rocks and bottles of glass and things like this at the, 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 the police, the, the uniform police lines. And uh, uh, this officer told me, okay, so you really want to leave? Because I said, like, okay, I'm, I'm against all this. I'm, I'm just going home. And uh, he gave a signal to them to stop throwing stones. And he told me to move in a particular direction, like out of the confrontation area, if I want out. And uh, this is what I did. And then there was another signal, and they started throwing again. They were security and civilian clothes. Which, afterwards, of course, was not the weirdest thing I've seen. <laughs> but at that time, it seemed like, oh, you know. <laughs> Anyway, that all stopped because religious institutions in a country that is very oppressive 
like Egypt, of course, they have always been under whoever is in power. The church had a hierarchy, so when the priests would tell the, the Coptic Christians not to go in protests anymore, they listen, they obey. Muslims, on the other hand, they have no hierarchy, so this would not work with them, but why should Muslims protest alone an attack that happened to Christians if they don't want to take part? So the movement collapsed again. But we all remember what happened in Tunisia. Things were getting very hot in Tunisia. What started as a movement of protests for social and uh, uh, you know, economical demands had turned into a revolution. This had encouraged some Egyptians to do what Muhammad Bouazizi did. So eight Egyptians, they put themselves on fire in different cities and different times, in front of government buildings. And this did not awaken the people. We tried. We have made our protests. As usual, our protests that we would call for on the internet would only have a few dozen people surrounded by security. The people out there in the street, they would look at us we're crazy, you know, because what do we expect? There is no way to change the situation. This was always the case since we started resorting to internet mobilization. So it was another failure. Then something happened which gave me a shock. A former police colonel, his name is Omar Afifi, who has political asylum here in the United States. He lives in Alexandria, near DC, in Virginia. And uh, he called, he, he's a former police colonel, so he called for a revolution on January 25th, the day of the police. And when I saw what he said on the internet, like when I got the message, I thought, has Omar gone mad? What's he doing? He's ruining all our chances for launching anything in 2011. Because, of course, this would be a failure. You cannot make a revolution in 10 days. And this is crazy. We've been trying to do this for years. <sighs> Thank God not that many people listen to him. But a few hours later, or even less, I realized that there is this big page called We Are All Khalid Said. Khalid Said is the name of a young man that was brutally beaten to death in front of his house in Alexandria because he got a video and he put it on the internet that shows police officers dividing what they had in a drug bust. <laughs> they were sharing the drugs and the money. So they wanted to give a lesson to anyone who would do this, and they killed him in front of dozens of people. They actually broke a marble step with his skull. Oh. And I, I've been there, I've been to his house, I know his mother, his sister, I, I've, I've seen him. Anyway, this page had over 400,000 members, and they're talking about it. Other Facebook pages, and I don't know what, are talking about it. Everybody's talking about a revolution, and we have no plan. We gotta meet. So we got to meet like political activists. We had this meeting somewhere in downtown in an office. We actually crowded the room, but we were like 80 people, 70 people, something like this. We're not that many. And the discussion was taking place. What should we do? We have originally had a plan for a protest on the day of the police, like we did the year before. We did the same in 2010. And everybody suggested that we have to keep on doing the same thing because we have no enough people to do anything different. They wanted to have a protest in front of the <laughs> Ministry of the Interior at 2 p.m. on January 25th. I have tried to challenge this, suggesting three locations, but that was not accepted because we don't have enough people. 
And I suggested, like, uh, maybe, okay, we should start with a small number of volunteers two hours before, so if they get arrested and beaten up, as I expected, then we will have a chance to move to a different location, everybody else, so the day will not be a total failure, and they accepted that. Uh, I left feeling defeated, frustrated, and thinking, we have definitely lost. There is no way that we can do anything if this is the way people are thinking. The next morning I had a call from a friend in the morning, uh, frustrated, telling me that uh, we should meet up and like discuss what should we do. We did that and then an idea came to me based on how about talking to the people and seeing how this is, like what do they think about it? We don't really do that, we should do that. I had this uh, journalist ID card that I have been using to go to places, you know, like to see what's happening, like if there are officials or, uh, I don't know, a conference or something like this. Because as a reporter, of course, you have doors that open to you more than as a normal person. So I had that one. So I used it with the help of this friend to be someone with me because I'm actually a shy person and I don't do these things on my own. <laughs> I need a little moral support. So I, I, I went from, I started like from noon until about seven when I got very tired, talking with people in the two sides of the Nile, the two banks of the Nile, the Cairo side in the east and the Giza side in the west, and a few neighborhoods. With specific questions that I will tell you, and I've been hearing those answers. Hey, excuse me, I'm a reporter. We are reporters, we are making this, small, this short story about the protests on January 25th. You don't have to tell me your name. I just want to ask you a few questions. What? Have you heard of the protests on January 25th? What protests? No, I haven't. Why are you asking me this? Like, nobody knows about these things. Things like that. Okay, actually these protests are against the regime of Hosni Mubarak because some people think that he had ruined this country. What is your opinion about Hosni Mubarak? <laughs> and I had about two-thirds of the answers against Hosni Mubarak, one-third very supportive of Hosni Mubarak. Uh, at the end of the day, when I was trying to think about those that were supportive, to Hosni Mubarak, I realized that they were the poorest, most suffering of all that I spoke to. Which changed my idea about our target group. And we will explain this. Of course I ended the discussion with those who would tell me that they are supportive very quickly because there was nothing else to say. But now those that were against Hosni Mubarak, I would tell them, Okay, I'm going to level with you. I am one of those who are planning these protests. And this is our chance to get back what's ours. We have to join hands, and if we don't do this now, we will be defeated because the son will take the place of the father, and we will have no chance. What would be the answer? What do you think? <laughs> no. Nah. Yeah, like... You think I'm crazy? Are you crazy? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't want to speak to you anymore. Sure. Okay, okay. Like, you are telling me you're against Hosni Mubarak, and I'm telling you, like, we have to do it. And you say, no, why? I got three different types of answers, sometimes joint, and like, you know, combinations. So, one answer was, of course, fear. Fear is very common. People don't want to get shot, disabled, killed, or arrested, tortured rape, disappear, and oblivion, and, and all these things. But another, even worse, factor was, what's the point? Uh -huh. There is no hope. People lose, they, they have no faith in their power. They would tell you, it's impossible. There is no way. 
They have two million soldiers. Who can stand against this? Do you think we'll ever have enough number? This will never happen. They will finish us before we start. And so on. Third answer, which was equally important under my point of view, was, as I was explaining before most of you have come here, about the economic situation in Egypt and how it collapsed. When Mubarak took power, Egypt was already collapsing, but it was number 40 according to the Human Development Report of the United Nations in 1981. But 30 years later, in 2011, we were ranked the 118th country, totally down the drain. So people would tell me things like, I'm working without a contract. If I don't show up at my job for a day, I'm gonna lose my job. Can you support my family? Of course not, sorry. Okay. Well, that was not the end of it. So I have asked that last question and I had an answer that I have heard so many times before, but never as many times as of that day, of course, because I did not talking to people the way I did on that day. So, this answer seemed an impossible answer. And what do we do when we hear an impossible answer? We ignore it. Because it's impossible, I cannot think about this. Then the best thing to do is to try other stuff. Right? So, what was the question and what was the answer? Question was, okay, I understand things are hard and you cannot join us now. Is there a way that you can join us? What would make you join us? And the answer was, of course, when I see everybody out there first, I will join you. When I see them with my own eyes out of the street, do you think I'm gonna stay at home? I'm gonna do it. If it is the big day and the big thing, I'll be on the front line, nothing's gonna stop me. Very nice answers, but still like, the only way to get people out is to get people out. This is impossible! <laughs> I've been hearing this before! But I've been hearing this from everybody! I ended around 7 o'clock tired and frustrated. I could have gone a bit longer, but I just was too frustrated. Because I don't... I haven't found a single person who even heard about it, and we thought everybody's talking about it. Okay, lessons learned. One, internet is a failure. We didn't want to admit this before because we thought, okay, we are doing this and it should work. You know, we, we get people say, say, saying that they're coming. They never show up, but they should. Huh. And things like that. But, Internet activists are keyboard activists, in our case at least, and they just do it in their virtual reality, not in the real world. They don't even interact with their family or their <laughs> neighbors or anyone. They don't tell it to anyone. They never show up and they never get somebody to show up. So it's always us, always the same <laughs> failure. <laughs> we have always had this tradition from our leftist kind of background <laughs> uh, that uh, our target is the proletariat and the poor and the working class. But in the case of Egypt, it seemed like this should not be our target group anymore. Why? People are too poor to have a solid ground to stand on. They also don't have source of information except for what the regime tells them, so they're completely brainwashed then they don't have the awareness and they don't have the, the minimum security that allows them to rise. We should look for a different category. Best would be young lower middle class. Okay. Third, the only way to get people out is to get people out. <laughs> okay, now here we are facing the absolute failure. This is not possible. <laughs> then, 
It's over. Yeah, I, I get a lot of these like very frustrating moments when I think it's over, but I still like you know try doing stuff. You know, it's normal. <laughs> so I get a lot of frustration. Uh, okay, but then like thinking overnight, twisting this in my mind, and as I was twisting in bed. I started having these like flashes of ideas that didn't seem to fit until something came up at the end. So one idea was how about my old plan? Is, is it salvageable? Is it possible to use it anyway? We cannot, we, we don't have any movement that is successful as I was hoping. <coughs> we don't have the whatever number of semi-independent small cells to, you know, start stuff on, on their, in their neighborhoods. But the idea should still work if I can find volunteers to do this in these neighborhoods. Because do we need them to be members of political movement? No. Do we need them to have any experience? No. All that I need, we need them to do is to know how to do it for that particular thing. How do we get them? And how can it start? Okay, that's another problem. But now there is this huge problem. The only way to get people out is to get people out. You can't. But, hey, there is a solution. The number of people is not about how many, always. It's about how many persons in how big of space? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's all psychological, it's about the perception. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have always been repeatedly, like stupid, making a very serious mistake. That is, we choose a big area for our protest <laughs> so that people can join. But instead of people joining, we are so small, we are so small, so we are surrounded by soldiers, which deters anybody from joining us because, come on, like, what is this? <clears throat> so, the idea has to be different. It has to be small space, small space. And then how should this be in a small space? Okay, this has to be done in conjunction with my original plan. So this has to happen in as many different neighborhoods as possible simultaneously, starting from the back streets and alleys which means that we have to have groups of volunteers that should be trained on preparing these areas so people would have awareness of what's going to happen and they would know we have plans for the protest on January 25th. And they should have enough faith that this is going to be the beginning of a revolution. Quite frankly, I didn't think this would be the beginning of a revolution. I have to tell you the truth. My idea was that I'm trying to salvage the situation so that we would have a good base for a revolution in April or July, as I originally thought. And then we can do this by then. But uh, uh, what happened was a big surprise even to me, uh, which was incredible, really. Uh, yeah, so I have started utilizing the lists of uh, uh, signees, I think is the word, in something called the Declaration for Change, which was made in 2010 by the National Association for Change, which had specific demands for the end of the regime of Hosni Mubarak. Hundreds of thousands of Egyptians put their name, ID number, address, contact information, which is very brave, because putting this information on the paper means I am an enemy of the regime, you know, like, it, it's a very big taboo and they did it. So the idea was to try to get persons that would seem to be within the category of what we want. Young, lower middle class, in a particular area. So every group from a particular area. <clears throat> Trying to get these persons and speak to them, one group after another, energizing them, telling them about the tactics of, the, of how to do it the police tactics and everything. So what did they need? They needed to learn how to distribute flyers without being caught, how to write graffiti without being caught. There are formations, time limits, and stuff like that. So everybody can be safe. Uh, there are tricks to use and, you know, 
So uh, I was trying to teach them this. I was trying to energize them with the fact that they are secure, they shouldn't fear because this is going to happen everywhere, they are not the only ones. And that security will never chase them in the back streets because it's against the strategy of security. If these things are happening in the back areas, they are not going to put their lines in trying to chase people in alleys where they could be ambushed. What happens is they withdraw completely, fortify their lines, and try to defeat the masses when it gets to them. I got this from Omar Afifi, the former police colonel. And uh, the other thing is how to start on the day. And as I said, they should find a, you know, a back alley area where they would start from the back alleys very loudly after preparing this area so the people would not be like, what's going on? Are they like people fighting? No, they would know this is the beginning of a revolution. And then they start joining because you would see a crowd that is loud, that is filling these back streets. And as they move, they grow. As they grow, they move to bigger streets and bigger streets and bigger roads until they go to the central point in every city, in every city that we want to occupy. I have been telling people to spread this plan, but never online. Never using the phone. From person to person. I did this in Cairo, and a few cities in the Delta to Alexandria, and the east to the Suez Canal. That's why on the first day of the revolution on January 25th, these were the only areas that had seen the protests. The rest of the country didn't... Okay, these areas plus Sinai, I have to mention this, because Sinai rose, they, they, uh, they started, but not based on my plan, based on an agreement on the internet. <coughs> As the call was happening in, in Cairo on the internet, I didn't take part in this, but they said that if they see protesters in Cairo, they would rise also, so they did it their own way. <clears throat> but the rest of the country didn't join until later. And it became a massive thing, of course, starting from January 28th, when I was freed from prison, as I would explain. Uh, so that day, yeah, before that, uh, actually, I have to say, on January 21st, I started something very different. In a city called Mahalla in the Delta, in the north. This city was a city that was already, in 2008, it was in absolute rebellion against the regime. And the regime used massive security forces for three days from actually security forces of five governors to crush the people for three days in, in 2008 until they subdued the city. And uh, this city never rose never had a protest ever since 2008, until January 21st. My idea was, this city had always been like an occupied city by security, out of fear that protests would rise again. And what we need is to awaken the city, not use my plans, because this is silly for that place. What this place needs is just to have the news that there is going to be something, and they would do it themselves. And when they do it, what will follow is that security will have no other option but to repeat themselves, getting troops from the other governments in order to reoccupy the city, which is going to give an opportunity for the amateurs with no experience that I've been training or like spreading the news to uh, in, in the other cities. And luckily that was not the case because the revolution re really was everywhere. So uh, we did the first protest ever in that city since 2008 on January 21st. And it was a big challenge, it was a big risk because of the security presence over there and we had to use our tactics. But I knew that the message was delivered and people are talking about it. Everybody was showing support and saying they will do it. And it was very, very promising. January 23rd was also an important day. January 23rd, I got finally confirmation from the so-called ultras. Ultras are the soccer team supporters who are organized and like underground organizations. And these uh, young 
boys and girls, they are very fanatic about their soccer teams. They like their soccer, soccer teams so much. I have been trying for a few years to get them involved in political activism and they've always failed. But with all the escalating, you know, things that are happening in Egypt and the spread of the message everywhere, as I told you, I thought I could play a little trick. And it worked. The trick was to tell every, that there were two organizations of them that are facing each other, kind of, and they are always very hostile to each other. But the, the, I, I, the message was that the other guys are going and they are going to teach the security a big lesson while you are staying at home. And you will have to live with that shame. So if you want to stay at home, stay at home, but then don't get upset. So both organizations, they give confirmation they are coming out and the, sur the surprising thing for me on January 25th was that they came together. I didn't understand why until later, because actually in the set of rules that they have, they are always against each other in every situation except for one, when they are facing the security. Then they join. <laughs> this is part of their rules. And I had no idea, but it was great. Why is this important? Because those guys, they became, and for a long time, our frontliners, spearhead, and the real force that was always in the confrontation. Uh, until now, I will say. When they come down and they join the protests, we know we can hold ground and we can win. And on January 25th, we couldn't have had Tahrir without them. Because they did a big job. They were the ones being beaten up and pushing the security in the front line while we were throwing stones and suffering the tear gas. <coughs> January 24th, what did I do? Nothing, of course. It was too short of time like for anything to be prepared. I just thought whatever was already done. There is nothing else that you can do. And I was just sitting there, you know, eating myself, being very nervous. And uh, I couldn't sleep the night <coughs> of January 25th until the morning. Then I fell asleep finally to wake up about 11 with my cell phone ringing. And then I'm answering, and this noise, wow, like very big noise in the background, and this guy screaming, we did it, we did it, we liberated some small town in the Delta. And it's total civil disobedience, we drove the security out, it's free, it's free, and I'm like, yeah, okay, great, yeah. It's only a little after 11, oh my god, it's really happening. Okay. And the phone is ringing again and again. And more news about rallies being formed, more news about areas that are having huge rallies or towns that are being either liberated or about to be liberated. And I'm getting dressed, trying to get dressed and answering the phone. And then I went out of home around noon without clear idea where should I go. Because of course, I never prepared any protest myself. <coughs> a few minutes after I left home, I heard big noises and I realized there was a huge protest near my house, so I joined them. And uh, some people recognized me and so I was helping to direct the masses. <coughs> and we went from there to like downtown and some uh, lower class neighborhood ne near downtown and then back to my neighborhood again and then from my neighborhood back to downtown and to Tahrir. We got there to Tahrir a little after four, already more than half of the square was taken by protesters and the battle was strong. We managed to get the, f the whole square by around 4.30 under tear gas and under like uh, water cannons and <laughs> regular forms of dispersing protests. They didn't use shotguns, they didn't use firearms. None of that was used until later. <coughs> so 
So we got the square, and the fighting continued for like the, 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 the ultras that I spoke about, they were trying to reach the parliament and the security was trying to push them back, so it was up and down until about six o'clock, with security still trying to invade the square. And then there was a truce. The security stopped fighting, so we stopped at uh, you know resisting, and uh, it was okay for a little over six hours until about half past midnight, when we were attacked very violently after every, after many of the tired people, of course, went home because we were not organized. People are not organized. Most of them, they were never in a protest in their lives. And uh, I, I kind of expected this because I had memories of what happened on uh, March 20th, 2003, when we managed to take the square and we were attacked after midnight the same way and scores were arrested. So I was trying to get the message around that people should stay, but of course, many left. And uh, that we need to have onion for the tear gas. But when you have a lot of tear gas, like it, it becomes useless to have onion or anything. Anyway, so they got to Tahrir again and they were chasing us in the streets. Uh, I managed to take around 2,000 people back to Shobra. And uh, then we were attacked again around half past two. So the trucks came, the soldiers came out and they started shooting. That drove me crazy, like, why are you shooting? So I ran to them, why are you shooting? You see any threat? And this officer told me, shut up, they killed a, a, a fellow officer and we will not rest until we end this. And that was not true. That was, I don't know, like, maybe he was saying this to justify it or they were cheated by their superiors, superior officers to be more violent with us or something, but that was not the case. Anyway. Then I heard a very loud voice with lots of authority saying, is that you? Get me this. SOB, of course. And so uh, he told me, or he said, like, I'm going to give you a lesson you will not forget for the next 40 years. Uh, he was the chief of police in the area, and I have been negotiating with him before in the previous protests, the release of activists that were taken. So I thought he did this because he recognized my face, and it's a random thing. Anyway, he said to his uh, guys to discipline me, so four of them, they started disciplining me. Uh, the first thing was that somebody snatched my glasses and smashed it very violently. Like, why the glasses? And as I was doing this, I had a real, you know, heavy punch that smashed my nose, so it stunned me. I have just like flashes of memory of those four guys, you know, uh, working with their hands and legs on me. Finally, I realized that I am in a microbus, and uh, when I was like starting to, you know, come around, <laughs> checking my pockets, I don't have my wallet, and I had my cell phone, so I tried to take the cell phone to make a call. I realized that I'm bleeding all over because it's all falling on the cell phone. I didn't know that my nose was smashed yet. Uh, but then I started to realize. And uh, they told me to turn off the phone, so I turned off the phone. And I was arrested and all that stuff, so I was taken to a central security camp, and uh, it was like a concentration camp. We were like 300 people in a ward that is a little bigger than this, and there was no access to toilet, so we were like cramped on one side, and people would do it on the other side. So it was kind of very hard, but not worse than what happened to other people as far as I know. It was not the worst thing. <coughs> anyway, a couple of days later, I was taken to a courthouse uh, to be interrogated, I think three days later. And I was interrogated, and then only I realized that I was a wanted man all along. I was accused of being the mastermind of conspiracy to overthrow the regime and uh, attack police officers and put uh, and sabotage you know, public and private property and stuff like that. So I denied all charges as usual. That's what we always do. Uh, like I was going home and I was attacked by these guys that I don't know and they stole my wallet and they smashed my nose and so on. And uh, that seemed okay until I was asked, but you were arrested several times before. How do you uh, justify this, how do you like, answer to this? Uh, well, in this country you can't really go around 
to anywhere without being arrested. <laughs> really? Okay, of course, it was bullshit. <laughs> so I was taken back down to the cells. And then things seemed to change in a way that like, something is happening that I have no idea what, the security doesn't seem to be normal. And then they opened our cells, they took everybody out, they put us in three big trucks, uh, prison trucks, and the trucks drove in different directions. <coughs> and I was out. They, they, they took us out. I didn't understand what's going on. I was out in the street with my torn clothes and bloodied face and clothes and everything. No money in my pocket, no transit anyway, because everything seemed to be closed and weird. There is military in the main streets that I had to avoid. And crazy stuff, I couldn't tell what's going on. Something weird and big is going on, but what? No, I have no idea. So, um, I had to walk aimlessly a little at the beginning and then started to get to know my direction, so I walked all the way to my neighborhood, which was quite a distance. And uh, when I got there, I wanted to go to a hospital for my nose. I was very disturbed about my nose, of course. Uh, and I wanted to fix it. So I went to this hospital, which is the second biggest educational hospital in the country, not very far from where I live. And I told them that I need to fix the nose, and they said, sorry, we can't help you. What do you mean you can't help me? We have nothing. What do you mean you have nothing? My nose, you know, like, you can't leave it like this. It's smashed. So finally, a doctor said, look, okay, we really have nothing. The whole country had failed. Everything has failed. But go to this address and ask them to get some device, that, you know, to put the nose. If you get that, I will fix your nose. So I went to this address, and I didn't have money, so I had to pick. And they finally accepted to give me this. I went back to the hospital. This doctor was not there. I had to pick for other doctors until someone accepted to do that for me. And he said, look, again, we have nothing. So we have no anesthesia. You have to tell me from now, are you going to take it like a man or not? If not, get out. And I said, OK, like, do I have a choice? We have to do it. Just please get somebody to hold my head. So he did get somebody to hold my head, and he broke my nose and put it together again, which was very disturbing. <laughs> anyway, I finally reached home on the verge of complete collapse, you know, like totally tired, unable to do much. And I wanted to know what's going on. So I started checking the intranet, and guess what? No intranet. <laughs> okay, so I had no idea what was going on, and I just collapsed. I finally woke up in the early morning, and uh, I just wanted to take off my dirty clothes and change and like shower and stuff, and go back to the square and see what's going on myself. I. Uh, I was in the metro in the underground and I realized it did not stop in Tahrir. So I got off one stop later and I, cro I crossed the bridge over the Nile going into Tahrir. And as I was heading there, this is incredible. All the smoke, all the fires in the distance. This is a major battleground. I got closer and the stench of the tear gas was still so strong in the air. I got in the area, not only fires and smoke, but blood, pools of blood in the street. And protesters are occupying all the place. No sign of security. Only security vehicles torched and destroyed. I went to the square, and then I took, actually I had a picture of myself, the only picture I had in, in, in the revolution, maybe, taken in front of a tank, because tanks were there in the square. And then I heard people screaming that uh, the protesters are being killed near the Ministry of the Interior. And everybody was rushing there, so I rushed there, because, you know, in, in, in situations like this, when you hear about a danger, you don't run away from it. You run into it, because everybody's full of enthusiasm, and you don't care anymore. So I ran with no idea what I'm going to do. And uh, 
once I step in the area where these things are supposed to be happening, uh, I saw fires, a lot of fires around me, like it, the, the heat was coming to me, that was generally cold. And uh, then this guy next to me, his head was blown with a live bullet because it blew his brains. And as I was like looking and you know, shocked, I had this uh, rubber coated bullet that actually is lodged in my head. So I, I got this, it, it kind of stung me, so I fell on the ground. And uh, I was in a, in a very uncomfortable position on the ground, of course, so I was stunned by this and uh, with the, the scene of the, that was the first time I see somebody killed, but it wasn't the last. Uh, the guy that was dead next to me, and uh, then I started hearing a strange sound that sounded like this. For a moment, for a few seconds, I didn't know what was that until I started seeing the dust around me. The sniper was shooting around me in a game of cat and mouse, waiting for me to make my move. Because, of course, I cannot make my move fast enough. And I knew once I tried to stand up, my head is next. So what choice do I have? Nothing. I was just waiting for each time I hear the sound to see where is the dust. That was what I was doing. Uh, waiting for the, this diaper to get bored and just to get it over with. But uh, there was a solution to this that I never thought about. The solution that was not even in my hands. Somebody who saw this came from behind me and grabbed me and pulled me away from the sniper range. I was like near the edge, you know, if this is the edge of the street, I was like, here. Because as soon as I got into the, the, the area where these things are happening, uh, I, I, I started realizing how bad it is. And so it was not a long distance, but I couldn't do it myself because I was lying on the ground. So I, I was taken away and my life was saved by someone that I couldn't even thank because by the time I started realizing that I'm bleeding and I'm getting out of the floor and I'm looking for this guy, so many were around me, I didn't know who, I was just in shock. Back to the square, we started our sit-in, we had several battles. Uh, we had uh, the attempt to use the military to crush us on uh, January 30th. Uh, with F-16s, you know, flying low and breaking the sound barrier on top of our heads and instructions to the armored divisions to crush the people and open fire but they didn't obey. The use of hired thugs on February 2nd, and for two days we were in a constant fight with them until we managed to liberate the buildings. They occupied throwing Molotovs and shooting us, and we got liberated everything until the flyover at the end of the square, and uh, so on and so forth, and we managed to hold the square. Uh, we were under siege, so supplies of water, food, and medicine were very scarce. And it was hard, but uh, many were risking their lives, especially even some rich people that were believing in the revolution and very supportive to the revolution. So don't exclude anyone. Everybody could help in the revolution. It's about what they believe in not where they come from in the economy or classes. And they would risk their lives. Some of them were stabbed to death or beaten to death as they were bringing supplies to the square. Some of them were thrown to the Nile with their supplies. <coughs> so, yeah. And uh, I was trying to preach in the square how to organize ourselves, building something that is called the Coalition of the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution. Several uh, of uh, the hardcore revolutionaries right now are actually uh, former members of this because this was built in a very decentralized manner. And so most groups, they became independent. So now the remaining uh, number is as small as all the other groups. We are all small hard hardcore revolutionaries in the square. 
And we work together still, which is going to be an important point about how to work together as in different groups uh, in a moment. And uh, yeah, so this is what happened. Uh, we kept on fighting because the military took over and putting us in one massacre after another. And we had incredible battles, like the battle of the first battle of Muhammad Mahmoud one year ago, where uh, chemical weapons were used, like white phosphorus against protesters, burning people from inside out, like nerve gas, VX, and Kabul. Anyway, it's the same now. We have another revolution started on November 19th, again as the protesters were trying to celebrate the first anniversary of the martyrdom of our friends. We lost 1014 a year ago in the Battle of Muhammad Mahmoud between November 19th and November 24th, which continued non-stop except for 90 minutes of truce. And uh, it's the same thing happening again. But luckily we did not lose as many people, like we lost three people in the square so far with gunshot wounds in the head and uh, uh, dozens of injuries and uh, dozens of arrests of course. But we have retaken the square and we are fighting the same fight. Somebody will say why you have an elected president. As a matter of fact, there was, there were lots of trickery about this past election putting us in front of two terrible options. It's uh, like, which is worse? But seriously, which is worse? Like, one former general of the, uh, in, of the former regime, uh, his name was Ahmad Shafid. He was the last prime minister under Mubarak. The other one is the spare tire, as we called him, of the Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> So between uh, the, sorry to say, I would have to say a bad word, the fucker of Ahmad Shafi, as we called him, and the spare tire, uh, as we called the Muslim Brotherhood guy, it was a very limited choice. So most people that were supportive to the revolution, they had no other option but to take the lesser evil, as we thought, the spare tire. What happened was that the spare tire and his Muslim Brotherhood group, which is a political group using the name Muslim, not really like that, Islamist, really. And uh, uh, they have made deals with the military and the deep state, as we call it, so that they are giving protection to all the murderers and all the criminals and all the corrupt guys from the old regime to merge together as a force, a ruling class, against everybody else, and turning the country into a fascist country in order to make it become like another Iran. So he gave himself exceptionally unlimited powers very recently, as probably some of you had heard, holding all three powers alone, executive, legislative and judicial and uh, people are fighting everywhere the revolution had picked up all over the country again incredible battles between the protesters and the attackers who belong to the security and the muslim brotherhood together against us the military had not intervened yet they keep saying that they are neutral even the police, they keep saying that they are neutral, but they still fight us. And when try to understand what's going on, we discovered that they are divided because there are the police ranks that don't want to have anything to do with this, and there are the criminals who are being protected by the Muslim Brotherhood, and they don't want to change it. So they keep on repeating their crimes. And the fight continues. Tomorrow, if you would look at the news, I hope it will be reported, you will see um, another million men march and protest. And uh, I hope we will not see more victims. But uh, this is going to be another serious message from the people 
after already the judiciary condemning this dictatorship, after the journalists and their uh, public as uh, general assembly this morning condemn this regime, and after the syndicate of labor doing the same thing because he tries, he's trying now to control all the labor unions as well. This would be the end of what happened. Now I want to talk about here and the United States, the Occupy movement. What are the major problems that the Occupy movement face here in the United States? What do you think an average American would think when they hear about the Occupy movement? Oh, they are a bunch of losers. They are misfits. They, uh, they have nothing better to do. That's why they go out in the street and do this crap. Get a job. Yeah, exactly, you know, just get a job, you know, do it yourself. This is America. This is a land of opportunities. Why aren't you trying? Okay, why is this? Two reasons. One is the media. The media is against you, of course. Always is, anywhere. Against anybody who wants change because the media is never free. Never free. But there is another very important factor. Image. The Occupy movement, variably depending on the location, should try to have an image that would make every American in that environment feel they could identify with them. The other thing is behavior. Screaming and showing a little bit of kind of fanaticism or being fed up with the rest of the people never helps. It never attracts anyone. What you should do is the opposite. That's what we do. What do we do? What we do is we always talk to the people. We are doing this for you. What are your problems? And then you hear their problems in front of others. And then we are against what makes this person suffer? And what we're trying to do is such and such. You hear an accusation and you tell the people about your answer. We do this in buses, in the metro, in different gatherings. We go out and do this in little squares and streets all the time. Why? Because the media is always against us. Much worse. Our media is totally calling us Traitors, paid foreign agents, and so on and so forth. Our protests are supposed to be orgies, where people are just fucking and taking and drinking and taking drugs. Sorry. This is what they say about us in the media. And I'm talking about a Middle Eastern country where people are conservative. So just imagine. Then, what people should do in the Occupy movement is to change this by being like average Americans, blending in with whatever environment and talking sensibly and accepting criticism. And just, okay, if you want to hear our point, we'd like to explain it to you. If you cannot hear our point, I'm, I'm very sorry, but like, you're free, of course, to believe in what you want because we are fighting for your freedom. You know? This is an important point that the Occupy movement should learn. The other thing is, how can you grow in number, not only to work on image? I think many members in the Occupy movement is already realizing the necessity of alliances with different other groups. I think it's already happening. But we have to even talk about this more clearly, if I may, if you allow me. There are, here in this country, so many groups doing so many fights for causes. Some causes would seem to be very bright and very intelligent and wonderful. Some causes even would seem like ridiculous and stupid. <coughs> but those people are trying to make change. When we look at any society in the world, we have to understand that change is never made by the majority. Change is never in any land, in any part of history, was the result of more than 20% of the population. 
This is a fact. Please look at history. Look at other experiences. This is how it goes. The challenge is how can we get involved? The 20% or the maximum we can get of the 20%, that's what we did in Egypt. Why is this? Because in any society in the world, you have 80% mainstream, don't want to challenge the norms. 20%, they have a bit of individual characters. They want to do something different. This different thing could be any, anything. But they're trying. Maybe sometimes misguided. Maybe sometimes doing the right thing. When we look at history, we have to understand that the most disgusting people in history and the most wonderful people in history are part of the 20%. Gandhi was part of the 20%. Hitler was part of the 20%. But see the difference. Being part of the 20% or the 80% does not mean good or bad. It's only about those who can get involved. And we want to get those 20% involved. So we have to talk with everyone, no matter what is their background. And if we do this right, you will get even people from the Tea Party on your side, believe me. Okay, so what is the argument? Hey, we want to talk. What is your problem? What are you fighting for? We are fighting because the educational system sucks, because people have to pay so much money, blah, blah, blah. We are fighting because students have, uh, I don't know, they're genetically engineered, uh, 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 you know, foods. We are fighting because we want to paint our neighborhood white. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so where do you think the problem comes from? Because this country is, there is something wrong. Because we are not allowed. Because there is this, because there is that. Yeah, but you know that we believe always in freedom and we want everyone to get their rights. We are totally on your side. Are you planning anything? We would like to sponsor that. Yeah, sure. We are doing this event, you know, such and such. We are on your side. Do you know why? Yeah? Because what you are fighting against is one of the symptoms of the disease that we are trying to eradicate. But I have to tell you, my friends, there are many other symptoms. And if we can fight the source of the disease itself, we can all be happy. What is the source of the disease? And then you can explain. You can explain about the, the, the control of the 1%. You can talk about how capitalism rules and how brutal. You can talk about many things. And don't ask them to join you. Never do. Ask them to be allied with you. Mm. Don't ask any group to be part of your movement. Ask them to fight for the same cause. Because we have to unite ourselves against that evil, against the source of all disease. This is our mission in order to have the change that we all desire, to have true freedom. Another issue that I would like to mention. Politics. You know what? Those revolutionaries in Tahrir and the other Tahrir or liberation squares all over Egypt, we have no political agenda. Sometimes this is used to criticize us, but actually it is the only thing that unites us. Yeah, sounds strange, huh? Okay. When we talk about politics, we are divided. I believe in this, you believe in that. Okay, we cannot work together. We have many, like, we have seriously different agendas here. What we do is, there are two different issues. Two issues that can never be together in the same place. One is politics. Other is change. You want change or you want politics? <laughs> it's a very important question. You can have your politics, not when you're fighting for change. You do your politics 
and the place for politics with your own group that does politics. But when you get into the action, it's for change. We're all brothers in arms. We're all equals. I don't care what you think. I don't care where you come from. We are trying to eradicate the evil. If we agree on this, we are the same. We fight together. This is very important, by the way. This is a very important key for success. This is very important when you have, like in our case, a brutal force against you. It unites like magic. I've been talking for much too long. I'm sorry, I must have bored you. No. <laughs> Oh, that's how we've all walked out. <laughs> well, 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 thank you, thank you. All right. In that last segment, are you saying that we should avoid uh, focusing on political causes because that would fracture the movement? Was that pretty much what your point? And what, what about like if, if there were uh, some common causes, for instance, in America, our, uh, our democratic process is very Absolutely. Uh, no, no, okay. I have to make this very clear. When you are doing this fight, nothing is absolute. There are no rigid rules. Everything is flexible and elastic. What you need to do is always to just figure out the situation and see what is the best way to do things. What, what have I been doing? What have I been doing was to work on the ground in Egypt, pretend, like pretending to do nothing publicly while working underground, and then security knowing, so I had to evade security and all that, etc. And trying to continue working in a way that is not clear for security, so they would have spies over me, and even I recruited a spy and got him close so that he would be the more trusted trusted source for the security, giving the security what I tell him to, to tell them because he was my guy. And things like this, it, it's a battle, okay? And coming here to the United States since 2008 to lobby, talking with politicians in the country that had always, sorry, but I apologize, but this country had always been supportive to everything that is repressive, that is unjust for us. I, I have never thought I would ever live in the United States in my life because of that. But I have no other choice. And my ideas also have changed by time because I think that uh, uh, things could change in a, in a very nonviolent and very peaceful way everywhere. Uh, so anyway, right. yeah. I just want to announce that this is the question answer. Sure, thank you. Yeah. So let's all clap for him. This is amazing. <laughs> um, Ahmed is going to be staying with us in the United States for a while, we hope, and actually needs funds to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to pass the hat. And um, we're also passing an email list if you guys want to add your email to it for the forum. So go for it. Please don't uh, uh, misunderstand me. When I talk about not to get involved in politics, I'm talking about not to get involved in politics when you are the Occupy movement, when you are trying to fight for change. But you can take your friends, other people that are like-minded, and do your own activism for that political agenda outside the hat of the Occupy movement. So you change hats. This is important. There is one thing that is this, and another thing that is that. You, you were saying you were talking to U.S. politicians. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, I, now I remember. So I, I was doing this, talking with people that had been staunch allies of Mubarak, and discussing with them everything. Discussing with them that democracy is good, dictatorship is bad. Sometimes having very uh, nasty confrontations, especially at State Department. Uh, was a particular person who was never very diplomatic with me and the three meetings I had with her before the revolution and uh, things like that so it like the point is 
I, I spoke publicly, for example, in a public session in the Congress with members of the Egyptian intelligence present. And like, it was very dangerous because I spoke against the American administration's support for dictatorships, particularly in Egypt and things like that. And I was even warned by Congress members not to go back to Egypt, and I did anyway, and, and so on. What is the point? The point is, don't leave any track or any door without knocking. You try every possibility. Never say, okay, we will never do that. If that can help, do it. Just under a different hand. Okay? We can all have different hands. When I do this thing, I do it as such. When I do this other thing, I do it as this other such. This is what I'm trying to tell you here. So let's just have an open mind and look at the bigger picture because that's how it is. Okay. Yes? Um, I have two questions. Um, one question is concerning the issue of the two candidates that ended up, um, you know, how, <laughs> how did it end up in that situation where you only had the, the two choices and how could that have been different? The candidates that were supposed to uh, represent the revolution were three. So the votes for the supporters of the revolution was, were divided. Mm -hmm. That is why we ended up with the other two that had big like supporters and power. <coughs> like the old regime was all their money and the Muslim Brotherhood was all their, all their trickery. So they are the ones who came as first and second. In the runoff, they became the only candidates. That's how we, we lost uh, that. So it's a good lesson also that there shouldn't be more than one candidate for the people who are aware. Otherwise, you always lose because their votes will break. And the other question was? The 80%. The 80% and the 20%. Okay, guys. The 80% the and the 20% are not like uh, separated. Like we have our families, friends, neighbors, either this or that. You just talk to the people. And your hopes are that when you're talking, you're talking to uh, 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 the 20% persons who will get involved, but also you are getting support of the people we call the sofa party people or the couch party people who like to sit down, watch their television and, you know, like go mainstream. Because when you talk to them, you can also change their point of view and they give you moral support. I mean, if we do not have members of our family supporting us morally, it's much harder. I, okay, we know that they will never come down with us, they will never do the fight, they will never protest, but at least they shouldn't call us stupid they shouldn't call us losers. They should think, you're doing a great job. I wish you best of luck. So it's very important to Absolutely. Yes, sir. So I have a question. Um, I think my women was criticized a lot, um, you know, my parents, friends, everybody, about not having a, you know, no demands. So and can you just still clarify a bit more? Um, I thought in Egypt and Tahir Square, they, they posted demands. Yeah, absolutely. I think this would bring us to the point about how we can all get this idea of eradicating the disease because, of course, we will have to define the disease based on your own American facts. So it's something that people should talk about and see how can they identify it or define it. What is the definition and how to change it? Maybe it's about another amendment in the Constitution. Maybe it's about other laws. Maybe it's about depriving some powerful entity from its power or reducing it or actually increasing it. Uh, maybe it's only about the election system and controlling the, 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 the cap of uh, contribution from every person or entity or business and so on and so forth. This is not up to me, so I leave it vague because this is up to you Americans to do it. I don't know. Uh, uh, as for the list of the demands, we did have a very clear list of demands, a very clear program on what we wanted, the ousting of Mubarak, the appointment of a presidential council, interim presidential council, a technocratic government, a uh, new constitution, uh, the purging of the different ministries and offices from the corrupt members of the old regime, 
uh, 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 getting back our stolen funds, uh, getting uh, 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 those members of the old regime accountable for their crimes. Like we, we had a list of all these demands, so we knew what we want, but this would be up to Americans to see what kind of demands they should put on the list. And it has to be a list of demands that could attract, again, the average American. So it shouldn't be too harsh, and it shouldn't be too soft. It should just be like within the area. Yes? Um, so I was wondering, you said you were surprised when people came out. Absolutely. I was shocked, actually, when I arrived to Tahrir. And OK, at the beginning, I was like taking part. and like, But when we cleared the square, and as other rallies were coming through, like over 20 rallies getting that day into Tahrir from different parts. And I just sat down on the sidewalk in a part near the center of the square. And I was crying, not for the tear gas, not because of the tear gas. I just like in disbelief, like, like, oh my God, like this was my dream for years. Where have you been? <laughs> like, I've been looking for you forever. And I see all this heroism and all these great, wonderful, like young men and, and women doing these incredible things. And it was the most wonderful, uh, you know, like wish seeing it happening in front of my eyes. It was a huge shock. And I knew this is the revolution. This is it, finally. What do you think it was that finally got people out? Repeat the question. OK, what was, uh, uh, what was it that finally uh, made that have yeah, to happen? Yeah, that you had to anticipate. OK, there were several elements. Uh, th th there were, like, uh, Tunisia was a contribution. Uh, the, the situation at that time was the country being on the verge of civil war because of the, sec the, the, the deliberate sectarian division that the regime was trying to do. Uh, and the plan, the plan that gave people their opportunity, because everybody who actually wanted to change, to, to create change, they just didn't have hope. And they were waiting to see crowds. They were waiting to see a real opportunity. And the psychological trick about space and number allowed this to happen. And uh, I don't know. I mean, the, 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 the collapsed economical situation, the disastrous results with the parliamentarian election in November 2010, which was something I expected. That's why I wanted this to be the turning point into the starting of like agitating, you know, and in making the population like, you know, very angry and all that. Uh, okay, Ruthie and then. Um, when you train those little cells of six to 20 people, can you be specific about what you told them, how to, what you explained to them was going to happen, how they should act, what they should This do? is uh, for a very different environment, because yeah. <coughs> the, the, the issues were how to do specific uh, issues, uh, like, uh, how do you say, like practices, to make the people in a particular area know that on such date, <coughs> there is a revolution. And how can they do this securely without fearing that they could be, get arrested? And uh, in a country where the regime is very repressive and you have cops everywhere, in civilian clothes and so on, it's hard to do this without a real structure. So I have come up with certain formations and uh, uh, particular practices in doing this, securing the area while you're doing it, and how someone can uh, 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 be saved if being under arrest, and, and like lots of tricks. But you don't really need to learn this here in America because you're not under the same conditions. The other thing is about how to start on the particular day and how to move. And the issue was to start, as I said, like in narrow spaces, very loudly, and like a little separate so that they would seem like something is big and it only shows in that particular place, but it's bigger, so more persons would join in and then it becomes bigger and it moves to bigger spaces and larger streets and so on. So that was another thing. I don't know how to translate this into American uh, environment, because everything here in America is about big space everywhere. Like It's always scattered around and so on. So I'm afraid this may not be a good lesson for the United States. But we've actually done it when we've organized our big days, like January 25th or whatever. 
groups start all over the place, different groups in Occupy, and then they all come together in one place. Okay, this is good, but in order to have a result, I think you would have to prepare those neighborhoods. So you have to connect with different <coughs> groups inside since it's very scattered around, so you try at least to connect with different groups inside. You coordinate with them on a particular date, uh, uh, the day of action, the time of action, the type of action, and they should, and you should help them spread the word around. And uh, I don't know about how, like, if, if it's possible to write graffiti, but graffiti on the walls is always a very good uh, method of putting a message out with a particular date, so everybody can see that because people would have to walk around or drive around and be look around. So it cannot be avoided. Uh, things like that. Uh, so I'll have just to tell you frankly, I think uh, the United States, you will need some time. Uh, I mean like, we, we didn't do this in, 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 in 2011. I mean, I, I started doing this since 2000. So it takes, it takes years of trying to do this. And uh, it, it's, it's not really that easy. Yeah, and the fact that the, the population is smaller, it's a much more repressive environment than the United States. It took them, you know, many, many years, us. And now, would it, would, 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 you know, you f did you feel that the revolution was done, it was achieved, or just Absolutely that? not. Exactly. No, 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 for so us the revolution was not done as the ousting of Mubarak. Uh, and, uh, but the problem is that the masses were cheated by the psychological warfare of the military. The military pretended they are there for the revolution, they are bearing the banner of the revolution, and they are going to do all our demands. No need to be in the squares anymore. It's already done. And then how can you get everybody to listen to you? And then when the numbers diminished three days later, they attacked everybody in Tahrir and they burned the tents. So they, 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 this is what they did. And then on March 9th, there was a big scandal of attacking the people who tried to be in Tahrir and torturing the men and doing the virginity tests to 19 girls. The virginity tests were the most humiliating thing a female should be exposed to short of gangbang rape. She would, like, a girl would be uh, stripped naked in front of the soldiers and molested by soldiers in front of everybody else. Which is really very big, like, shameful thing in our culture. And it was made to give a message for all females never to go again to the square, but it failed because females kept on going. So, it, 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 like, they have been doing everything, every trick in the hand to defeat this revolution, but I am telling you, look at the news, it's still burning. Did you do formal nonviolence training before the revolution began, and what form did that take to try and ensure that it wouldn't be a nonviolent revolution? No. The answer is no training was made. Only the methods that we spread were based on the principles of nonviolence. <laughs> And it, it spread like fire, like it had an energy uh, of its own, a life of its own. So the idea became that, and until now, <coughs> revolutionaries should never use any lethal weapon. Any lethal weapons are not allowed in the squares. No knives are allowed, no guns are allowed, even when we are under attack. But we can, we'll have to defend ourselves. We defend ourselves using stones, or whatever objects that are unlethal. And uh, when we are under attack, we use Molotov cocktails to uh, uh, scare off the invading troops. So we force them to retreat. This is what we do. But we never caused the death of any soldier. We never uh, used any lethal force against our attackers. Even in the harshest times, we always scream loudly by one person after another, we are your brothers and sisters. We are doing this for you. Don't be the tools of the oppressors. If you defeat us, you will be the losers. They are using you. And we keep on using this psychological warfare as well 
to convince the other side not to use lethal force against us. And to tell you the truth, in many occasions they use live ammunition. Many occasions. What? Live ammunition, real live bullets. But still, the number of victims had not been as high as it should be when you look at protests, you know, with tens of thousands of people or so. Why? Uh, I remember that I was approached once by a message from a member of uh, special forces called uh, Triple Nine. They are really, really like very highly trained commandos that go behind enemy line, and they would use the against us. And he was telling me in the in, 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 in the in the message that they are very supportive to what we do, and uh, they just don't know what to do because they are told to shoot us and to fight us. And uh, the thing is, I told him, follow your orders. Just when you shoot, don't aim at us. <laughs> and this is what they have been doing. Like, I remember during the clashes in December last year, that they even re had, they, they were even like having their cars moving and machine gunning us. But they would not turn the machine gun to shoot you in purpose. They would do the, the, the they would machine gun us in a line giving you time to hide. If you don't hide, you get killed, of course, but like, once you hide behind an object, it, it gets hit, but you don't get hit. So actually, we have been reaching the conscious of, some, of, of many of these soldiers. Only the brutal criminals, the snipers, that's a different story. Snipers would just shoot to kill. They, they aim and they kill, and they are the worst. But normal soldiers, they don't want to do this. And uh, this was an effective tactic. You have to have a sense of direction. You know, what do we do to make a strategy? We have a major goal. And we have to see how can we get to that goal. And then we understand that there are minor strategic goals that can help us to do this. And we have to understand that there are tactical ways that could seem to be a little bit unstraight, but they can help us reach the smaller goals leading us to the finally reach our final objective. And without this vision, the mission is unclear. We have to have a vision for the mission and the goals to be clear and defined. I think that defining your goal, your, your, your final uh, objective, is like uh, the basic thing that you should have to have a direction. Without this, we have no sense of direction. Like, Exactly as yeah, I, I hear today here that uh, the, one of the problems about the Occupy movement is not having clear, you know, like demands. So we will have to have this sense of direction. We have to know where is our objective in order to make a force, a movement, you know. Uh, sir, you wanted to. Well, a few of us here were in Tahrir Square. Uh, in January 2011, I think it was a year before the revolution <coughs> developed there. And we were there on a journey trying to get to Gaza. There were 2,000 or more people came. Okay, I know very well what you're talking about. I have spoken with many of your colleagues okay. at that time, and I even organized with a few of them uh, a protest, okay. actually, on January 16th. Okay, well, I'd like to ask uh, you a question about that. With those that remained, I organized with them. It was the first good. joint protest good, yeah. between, yeah. between, between the Gaza Freedom March and the Egyptian yeah. activists. That was really yeah. great. But just one thing that we were wondering about was, we were pretty, aware. at first, we were concerned because we knew that Mubarak had, a, you know, me as kind of soldiers and terrorists and all that sort of stuff. But around the square, there were always these big bodies of, of soldiers, I guess, uh, supposedly ready to crack our heads and all of that. Now there was one day when we started trying to march and block the streets and they kind of pushed us out a little rough, but most of the time they were doing that and in fact we were feeling, most of the people, we had a lot of code pink people there and, and really feeling badly for these guys because it was obviously they were oppressed, most of them. They were, they were in these movable barracks and and they had almost no food. The soldiers, and, and so yeah, the soldiers, part of the exactly. Yeah, not the twenty. The soldiers that are used against us are always put in the harshest possible conditions yeah. in order to be easier to control. 
and we have um, these jokes about them. So I will tell you a joke for a change. <laughs> they are doing their compulsory military service. So when new, you know, yeah. like recruits are taken by the military and they are standing in this big space, the general would come and say, everybody's attention. Now, those who can read and write, go to this side. They will go to that side. And then he would say, attention. Those who cannot read or write, go to this other side. They go to this other side. And then there is a group in the middle. You, central security. <laughs> These are the, 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 the anti-protest ranks. And then uh, they are chosen always from the most ignorant, most suffering ranks. They get the worst conditions and they are treated as animals, unfortunately and uh, they are used for that to do anything, no matter how protest. Yeah, the, yes, sir, at the back. Um, you hear a lot about global revolution. And there's a, you know, do you, in all your experience, do you see any, anything that would unite all the people of the world against their governments in a constructive manner? I mean, Absolutely, I'm already in touch with many of the organizers of these things that have been doing this for years. Have you identified the, uh, the disease, you know, the, the cause and not the symptom? Okay, uh, if I would have to say something uh, about the disease, it's actually based on the combination of economical control and politics. So in order to continue economical control over the world, there is politics that is used to do this, impor in, 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 impoverishing nations and peoples and stuff and uh, ruining economies and rising others and creating more divisions between societies and leading people into wars and confrontations and all this, all those evils, they come from that. Uh, Is there yes. a head to that serpent? We hear all these stories about the Illuminati and about the <laughs> masonry and God knows what, <laughs> but I don't know, I mean, it, it just happens, it exists. The world, are those ideas shared? I mean, yeah. There are people everywhere who would put the blame on the secret behind the curtain, yeah, like big guys that are doing this. But I, I would say it's basically those who are in control of the money. Because money buys politicians. Politicians have power. They have power in bigger countries that can have power over smaller countries. Smaller countries are led by corrupt rulers who are stealing money. So again, it's money that rules. Could it be modern Zionism? No. I don't think so. Zionism is a racist idea about a chosen people who are superior to others, who have a, a, a supreme right over a piece of land. Aren't they involved in the banks and the money control? There is no relationship, really, I think. I mean, of course, there are supporters to these things who are Zionists, and there are supporters to these things who are not Zionists. There is no relation. It's like anything. It's like anybody. It's, it, Zionism is a political idea which is based on giving supremacy to a type of people and I can put it alongside with what we are trying to change now in Egypt with the attempt of the Islamists, not Muslims, those who use political Islam to pretend to be superior than everybody else or the idea of uh, 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 the Ku Klux Klan with the, the white supremacy ideas against other races <laughs> And all these things, this, this is a totally different story. It's not what we're talking about here. Uh, yes, sir. I will tell you something you would probably find funny. I actually had dinner with George Bush in his house in Dallas about uh, a little more than a year. <laughs> uh, summer last year, not this year. fun to hang out with. Uh, and he was great fun to hang out with, yes. And uh, it was very, very strange. It actually gave me a very important lesson because seeing this, living this experience, I understood something that had always puzzled me. How could Germans, very intelligent people, very wonderful people, fall in love with Hitler and do terrible things? I never understood this, but sitting with George Bush, 
Damn, he's charming. <laughs> like, you cannot criticize him in his, into his face. I tried. But he's so nice and humble and sweet and like, you, you, you know, like I will have to be a, a, a bad person to be impolite with someone so nice. <laughs> but now it is able. <laughs> it was like very hard for me because I know I'm sitting with a man that I have considered for years a major uh, responsible for horrible bloodshed of hundreds of thousands of people like if the blood that he spilled would be put in an area it would fill major football <laughs> stadiums probably not just swimming pools but uh, I just wanted you to understand that these guys, they are talented. They know what they're doing. He's not stupid. George Bush is very smart. And the other guys around him, they're not stupid either. They knew what they were doing. They believe in what they were doing. We have to spread awareness. We have to make people see and understand this is the only way to have any possibility to change this world because the other side they are not stupid. The other side, they are powerful, they have money, and they are intelligent. Absolutely. I, I remember I had a meeting at the Pentagon. Yeah, I had a few meetings at the Pentagon. <laughs> I told you I had to speak with everyone. Uh, I remember I went to the restroom, and as I was standing, you know, doing what people do, there was another guy next to me doing what people do. And I, that is an Egyptian general. Yeah, you know, I know our uniform. Damn. Of course he wouldn't know I'm Egyptian. You know, so I'm just another guy, you know, doing whatever people do. <laughs> and then I went back to uh, the meeting I had, and I said, I just saw an Egyptian general in the restroom. And they said, oh, of course, they come here all the time. That was the answer I had. When I also, in another occasion, had a meeting with uh, an assistant secretary of defense, trying to convince him at the time that the military in Egypt are evil. That was impossible. No! We, we, we are in great terms with them. They are great guys. You just don't understand. Shouldn't you be thankful that they didn't kill you all? <laughs> you know, so, yeah. So that's how they buy people. The other thing was the cotton, because wasn't the uh, cotton strike what um, the young activists helped organize that also came before um, uh, you know, to square. Actually, I spoke about uh, what happened in Mahalla. It was not just a cotton strike, it was a whole uh, a city revolution, city in rebellion in 2008. I, I mentioned that earlier, uh, that it happened in 2008. It was important. There is a woman here who organized corporate responsibility, accountability, and she works just on Egyptian cotton. And people go to Macy's and you can buy 100% luxury Egyptian cotton towels in any shade or of any color that you want. And I think that it, it has to go into the American consciousness, the way that uh, Congo activists have raised the coal team for the cell phones. I think it's, you know, Egyptian <coughs> cotton in the... Well, yeah, there are lots of very wonderful causes. Of course, this is important too. So, V, and then you, sir. How did you get all those people? Because I know there's thousands of people that came out to Harrier Square to sit down and get and work on this one document. No, no, this never happened. <laughs> this, this never happened. I have to tell you something that, as I mentioned earlier, and I have to repeat, this is a leaderless revolution, which means that it's a total horizontal masses of people. Everybody is taking their own initiatives. Like, we started a spark, just uh, the catalyst. And then there is all this process, you know, the chemical, you know, whatever, everywhere. Bringing out tens of thousands of possible leaders, people with initiatives, people doing great things, people like some that you are meeting, probably every now and then. And people who may have done that declaration, which I'm sure is a wonderful thing. Uh, sir? How are, how are you going to combat frustration from the uh, masses and also are you going to have a change of strategy after you... No, 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 it's already happening, you see, because it never really stopped, the revolution continues, it had waves, 
Now there is just a big massive wave because now we know like there is this dictator that has to be brought down. All the slogans are exactly the same slogans that existed before until we ousted Mubarak. The challenge is harder, not because of those issues, but because we are facing a much bigger enemy who had learned a lot of the lessons from before. It's a combination of all the old enemies in addition to those who use religion cheating with it the poorer and more ignorant race drop off in your people you don't see a drop off like occupy we got our drop off you know no 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 and i think tomorrow you will see that very clearly you will see how crowded the rear would be so much of the left in the middle east has been really decimated unfortunately through the, the dictators that we've supported and in your opinion if some of those parties um, would still be around and more powerful, you know, let's just say that a socialist tech party over there or, you know, other more radical leftist parties. Would, would that, do you think, made a difference in where we are today with the continuation of the revolution and not being to Forgive me if I would say that uh, when it comes to political parties and their involvements, we, the hardcore revolutionaries, we have absolutely no faith in them. There you go. There are two existing powers. One is leftist and one is liberal. The liberal is called al Dustur or the Constitution, led by Muhammad al Baradai, and the leftist is called the, the, the Popular Current, led by Hamdin Sabahi. And both, they have colleagues that I have known because I, I was doing this for long but we have no faith in them. They don't really take direct part and contribution in the hardship that we are doing. They come for media shows sometimes and they leave. And this, in addition to their underground deals, let's say, or under table deals, sometimes based on their political agenda and possible gains, have always been a reason for us as real revolutionaries doing the fight, uh, a reason for us not to trust them. Uh, I have been offered, uh, quite frankly, several times taking leading positions in political parties. Actually, when I came here to the United States in February 2011, two weeks after we ousted Mubarak and they had very wonderful reception in Washington and incredibly high level meetings, of course, I had with me in my bag the paperwork of a new political party that someone wanted me to see, offering me to lead it and he would fund it. And of course I never did. I do not believe in politics under uh, repressive environments and I believe that change has to be reached first and then we can do politics. No politics until change is made. Okay, here. <laughs> okay. Are you talking about change in the consciousness of the people? Is that what you mean by change has to be? Change of the rules of the game. Yes. When there is a fair and free opportunity <laughs> for the people under conditions that allows them awareness and knowledge of who they can choose, then there is a chance for democracy. Otherwise, we only have fake forms of democracy that are never really truthful because we, People can choose because they don't know, or people are being manipulated, or the money wins, or in repressive like environments like we have, whoever can manipulate or play around or rig elections is the winner. Yes? Uh, just along the same lines, because I noticed that officially it says more <coughs> was a uh, political party is the Freedom and Justice Party. Is that just a name to kind of throw out? Absolutely, of course, it's only a name, freedom and justice, because we are fighting for freedom and justice, of course. So they took that name to deprive it from its meaning. And for years we have been living the same lies. Under Mubarak, we were always told we are living in the most flourishing ages of democracy. <sighs> Dictators always resort to this. They always deform the great names, making them express terrible situations that you live in. Yes, ma'am? What are your current list of demands? Our current list of demands is no different than the original list of demands <laughs> that we've had since the beginning of the revolution. Again, we want an 
interim period for building a constitution under a presidential council. There is a demand now that this council is led by Muhammad al Baradi and Hamdin Sabahi, like two, two names I mentioned before, and uh, that they would be responsible for the transitional period and so on and so forth, so that we can do the things that I told you about. New constitution, purging the different uh, ministries, reforming the security and the uh, military, etc., 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 reforming the economy and everything. Um, yes. What kind of trigger event do you think could be precipitated by peaceful action in America that would stir people? Not really sure, but actually, yeah. probably if Romney would have won and uh, the United States was about to get involved in a war with <clears throat> Iran, for example, another war. This could have been a major uh, trigger, mm -hmm. but I'm glad that Romney didn't win because we don't want people to die for building a trigger. This is one thing. The other thing is, I don't think the Occupy movement is ready yeah. enough or for, for, for actually doing this. I think the Occupy movement needs a little bit more time to reorganize and to work horizontally with other groups and to try to build the, uh, uh, the, the, the common uh, goal issue that I have tried to suggest earlier and all that and when this is achieved then you will be just working horizontally waiting for the trigger to come about and then when it comes things would just take a life on their own as it happened in Egypt and as it happened in other places. Uh, yes, ma'am? Um, this is a sort of more personal question. I'm pretty ignorant about sort of your background and how you came to you know, this okay, my background is uh, I'm, I'm a bit older than my looks, I'm 45. I have been doing this for a very long time, but with a big break in the middle. My father was a polit my, my family had always been involved in politics. My uncle was one of those who made the 1952 revolution. And because of his belief in democracy, when Nasser uh, ousted the first president, Mohammed Naguib, in 1954, my uncle was one of the five officers that were pro-democracy and they were ousted together from the Revolutionary Council. Uh, and my father was uh, doing, mm, let's say, non-violent resistance against the British presence in Egypt before the 1952 revolution and even after. And he was uh, not just a political activist at that time. When we had political parties, he became one of the leaders of one of the parties that he were launched it got, uh, in 1976 uh, called the Socialist Labour Party and then afterwards he became uh, the vice president of the new Young Egypt Party, a remake of the uh, Young Egypt Party before the revolution which was the only party in Egypt that was against the king and wanted to make Egypt a republic, uh, democracy and uh, fighting the British presence. Uh, I have been involved with my father but still not a member in his party but there was no chance to be in, do any politics without being close to a party. Uh, and uh, then my, my father died in 1991 and uh, one of his last words to me was that I should promise him never to get involved in politics because politics are corrupt. Mm -hmm. And I have obeyed him until now. And I did obey him. I am not a politician. I'm never involved in politics. But starting again in, in, in 2000 with the uh, Palestinian Intifada and then of course, with the American invasion in Iraq in 2003 and so on. And then we made Kifaya, the Egyptian movement for change in 2004. And I became a member of the coordinators committee, although I remained independent. And then I led the first youth movement in the country in early 2005 called Youth for Change and so on and so forth. This is kind of short of my background. So your, um, your educational background? Uh, my educational background, I studied uh, tourism <laughs> first, <laughs> uh, which sounds ridiculous. Yeah, I, I did that. And, uh, and I, I studied uh, uh, some psychology and then I did my own, let's say, unofficial studies of uh, 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 ancient history, uh, comparative religions, uh, and classic, classical philosophies. And uh, I have been studying this and teaching this in uh, philosophical or uh, uh, cultural organizations and so on, this was my main, uh, how do I say, like uh, obsession since uh, my father died until I went back to political activism. And even during the early time, because of course it was not a direct shift, <coughs> it was gradual. And uh, uh, I have learned a lot from studying uh, philosophy and history as probably those who came here earlier. Uh, have uh, uh, found out because we have some discussions in, in these areas and uh, if 
there is any chance that we talk about these things, um, I'm always uh, open. Uh, yes, and you, sir? Um, I'm a little confused about the uh, what you're saying about politics because it seems to me like what's the end goal? Isn't the end goal to get rid of the current government and the system and replace it with one of the people? So it's kind of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? How are you going to do that yeah, if I'm, you don't have anyone positioned? Absolutely, but there is, okay, in this world, as we all know, there is no such a thing as absolution or something that is perfect. Everything has a bit of good and a bit of bad. The idea is now, we have to choose. <clears throat> Are we going to start by divisions or unity? And then, if we start by divisions, we will never get there. But if we start with unity, and then we get there, and then have our divisions and our political dif our different political agendas and you know uh, competition and so on, then it's easier because at least we will give people a chance to actually have you know discrimination, like what to choose. Okay, I, I like anarchy. I'm going to be an anarchist. No, I like liberalism. I like you know this. I like that. I like socialism. And people can choose because then they would hear the right messages. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. <clears throat> um, as you're probably aware, in, in the United States, I think. It seems like most of the left spend the majority of their time fighting each other. Not only in the United States, <laughs> everywhere. This is one of the characteristics of the left ideas, unfortunately. What, what can we learn from your experience in Egypt? How do you get people from as I, Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said before, the best way is always to listen to different people first. So now somebody is telling me they have a problem about the foreclosures. Yeah. And they're fighting because it's unfair and because banks are corrupt and they are trying to take people's houses without having a legal uh, 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 you know, right for it and so on. Wonderful. So we talk to them with this ideology, with this idea, not ideology, sorry, my bad English, and as our main focus. And we support this. We were working with the guys that are against foreclosure. I know some of them, uh, of course, maybe some of them are here. And we have to understand, again, when we like, now we are talking together that this is one of the symptoms of the disease that we are all suffering, etc., etc., etc. It's about how the banks are in control because the system is faulty. How can we change that? And you get them to work with you, any group, no matter who they are, as long as they are not racist or violent or I don't know white supremacist or whatever. Any group, you can find some common ground to get them on your side. Because they are fighting for a cause, and this cause is because they have realized there is something wrong with the society, or with the political environment, or with the economy, or whatever. Something even about the, the, the environment and the, the ecology, anything. And they want to change this. So we go from there. Okay, there is pollution in this place. Why is there is pollution? Because there are factories that are do doing I don't know what. And, or like the forests that are being you know, the trees that are being uh, cut down, or whatever, every cause is a good cause if you can sit down there, talk with the people, get them to understand where the problem is coming from, and how can we really solve this problem once and for all. Not only this problem, all the other problems that are disturbing other people. Why are they doing this? Because they are trying to cause diversion and because they are trying to co-opt organizations, right? Yeah. Okay, very nice. We welcome your help. <laughs> we want your money, but we'll do what we're doing. And if you don't like it, go big F word yourself. I won't pay you back. So what? So what? It's good. Yeah, use every possible track. Use every possible door. Don't let anything. Just remember to continue on the path, to know your end goal. Don't be diverted. Don't go off course. Remain on the bus. Uh, Ria, I would have to say again that uh, this is not really possible. I even told you about my own movement, which was, when it started, the only movement, Tahrir, or the first movement. <laughs> and then it broke apart into so many different small groups. This is natural. We, uh, we are humans, exactly as we said, and sometimes we just can't work together. It's OK. We can be divided into as many small groups as 
people want. It's not the point. It's even better. Because if it's like one group, then it's like there is a certain one kind of direction for ideas that are going somewhere. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe it doesn't knock on every door. But when there is a hundred, then a hundred doors being knocked on. The, the, the point that is always very important, and I repeat, is as long as we have the common goal very clear. In our case in Egypt, our goal is very clear. Nobody can disagree about this. All the revolutionary movements, they know very well what do we want. This is never a matter of dispute. Right. So, if this can be achieved here in the United States, now, next year, in five years, then you are on the right course. And no matter how many divisions, this is good, not bad. Don't even try to unite, because when you try to unite, you actually make people feel you're trying to control me, mm -hmm. you're trying to hijack our movement. I don't want to work with you under these conditions. Again, I will have to say, nothing is absolute. There are always exceptions to every rule. Don't take my words for like 100%. Every situation is different. Every case is different. It's an individual case. Regular media depends on their agenda. In the case of Egypt, they have realized that the revolution seems to be winning. They had to choose sides and try to polish put higher certain persons that would seem to be good to serve our agenda. In the case of the United States, they decided to do this with some people. In the case of Al Jazeera, they decided to do this with other people. But every side had their own agenda. In the case of the United States, what did they want? This was an internet revolution. The guy who made it is a Google guy. <laughs> and it was on Facebook. It's Google, it's Facebook, it's Silicon Valley. Without Silicon Valley, no revolution would have taken place. Crap, sorry, this is not <laughs> uh, So, this is what the United States was trying to do. And on the same line, they would try to do the same with certain persons that probably hear their names, who had absolutely no part in the action or in the call. With Al Jazeera, they decided to support two groups. One is the, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood. The other is my old organization, April 6. Because the guy who took over the movement, he went to Qatar, and he was given money, as it seems. And uh, uh, this is at least what I was told. And uh, they decided to uh, support him and his group. And then, on and off, they were dealing with that, depending on the interests and how this could help the Muslim Brotherhood, because they are in alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood at, at, at the time. <coughs> uh, which, of course, has been very disturbing to us. Uh, yeah, so this is just, in short, about media. Media is always biased, has its agenda all the time. One of my biggest ambitions, which I don't know how to achieve because it seems impossible as usual, but I, I've been trying to do this, I've been talking with people and failing, is to try to make a satellite television that is free, that actually tells the truth, that actually is very objective and talks with the people and tells things as they are, without any previous agenda, without my, our own agenda and our own liking and dislikes to be involved because truth is important. <coughs> and when people know the truth, I trust that they would take the right decisions. If they know the truth, that's what I'm hoping for. Yes, yeah, things happen by themselves because once there is a common goal, you have no reason to quarrel with anyone anymore because we are all fighting for the same thing. We are all brothers and sisters. We are all just the same. So it doesn't matter if we are different groups. We are just working for the same thing. If somebody says, let's do this, and it sounds good, let's do it. If somebody says, let's do this, and it doesn't sound good, OK, we're not going to do it. It doesn't seem like in accordance with what we want. It's over. And that's how things are happening. OK, I think we need to finish very soon, right? So maybe one more question or something? Yes? Yeah? Who are the ultras to soccer 
fanatics that you were saying. Can you just, that is so fascinating. They were sucker supporters, uh -huh. organized underground. And there are reasons for why I got to attract them after a lot of failure. Because uh, when they started, and I was fascinated with their organization, I have tried to connect with them. I even had one of the leaders of the two major groups to stay with me in my house for a couple of months, tried through him to infiltrate and get these guys into activism, and it failed. They never wanted to have, take any part in activism. But in 2010, and as part of the preparation of the regime to uh, you know, try to have absolute control over the country, <coughs> <coughs> uh, they have been attacking the homes of these uh, uh, members and leaders of these underground soccer supporters uh, and they would be mean to their families and so on they would try to recruit them so they would have them into custody and uh, threaten them and so on because they wanted to have absolute control over everything and these guys are rebellious but they didn't feel like they should get involved until there was this call on one hand for something on January 25th and then the trick and the message that I sent <coughs> through a, a couple of persons to each leadership and then getting <coughs> the positive answers and then them getting involved until now. And I don't know if any of you had heard about the massacre in Port Said to uh, uh, some of these soccer supporters when over a hundred of them were brutally massacred. Uh, after the stadium doors were welded right. and uh, they were attacked uh, and slaughtered. Uh, so yeah, and like they are, they are, they are always on the fight. Uh, I think we need to finish. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.